Welcome, I'm Lori Lee Benstock, host of a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. Managing a child's behavior is one of the biggest challenges parents face. Many parents think that physical punishment is an acceptable form of discipline with more than two thirds of American adults agreeing or strongly agreeing that children sometimes need a good hard spanking and that's according to the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Spanking may work temporarily to stop children's problem behaviors, but it may not change their behavior in the long run and can potentially develop into PTSD symptoms. Joining me today is Imani Khalid, host of Misconnected Podcast, founder of Envia Foundation, and author of There Was Violence. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Really happy to be here. Really, really happy. Oh, well, I appreciate it. You know, your book was fantastic. It was just, it was so, it was just interesting to kind of, you know, read this, your story develop. You know, in, in the opening of your book, you describe a situation where you felt unsafe, potentially around a person who could have been on drugs and, and you played out kind of the worst case scenarios in your head. And can you describe to me and my audience, because I feel like this is a moment when you began to feel very curious about your own thought process and inevitably about your past. I, I think a good place to start is, is just me noting that the book is largely based on my life. I, I, I had a, a, a public moment in Marina Del Rey, California, where I thought I was gonna have an altercation based on experiences in my past. And so that was the moment where I started really diving into the causation, asking myself, okay, what's, what's happening? What's going on? This was a tipping point. But uh, so, so that's, was the whole, that was the whole purpose of the book. But in terms of the story itself, really and truly, that, that was my, that's my earliest memory. That, that moment when my mother was raging at my sisters and I just happened to be in this guest house. Um, you know, it, it just, at, at that age where I think I was around four or five years old, it had, you know, me, me, me working in the entertainment industry, I tend to make a lot of entertainment references and pop culture references, as you may have noticed. Mm -hmm. But all of the elements of that moment uh, it, it had all the elements of somebody, you know, not really understanding the gravity of the situation. You do understand that it's serious, but you can't really place, I couldn't really place tags or titles to the characters, which was myself, my sisters, and my mother. And it's, it was a thing of, or a situation of who's the villain? Like, are, are my sisters the villain? Mm -hmm. Am I inadvertently a villain? Is my mother the hero? Is she the anti-hero? So, you know, just starting with that moment, I felt like, uh, you know, this was really story worthy because my thought was, if this is happening to me, I can't imagine, I can't imagine how many tens or hundreds of thousands of other people this has happened is happening to or is going to happen to at some moment in their life. So I thought the best use of this medium was to tell it through a book versus uh, just some long verbal narrative on uh, a, a YouTube or some audio recording, uh, which which is appropriate depending on what people's tastes are. But when, when I reflected on my early life, which was, really and truly, it was a 90,000 word journal entry. You know, um, when I come through everything, I said, man, this, this whole ordeal, uh, it, it, you know, it, it has some, some story elements to it. So that's really why I decided to craft it into a book and, and lay it out the way that I did. Yeah. I, and, you know, I'm in the beginning of the book, you talk about you walking down the street and you seeing a person who looked like he was on drugs and you were like thinking, what are you going to do should this person attack? You know, and I think that's when you were like, okay, I need to, I need to figure this out. And then you said you journaled, you were journaling. 
and it would and, and that you said turned into this book what were your what are your intentions now that you've written this book my intentions are to get it into as many hands as possible if if i can and, and that's that's one of the reasons why i do the podcast i this at this stage of my life it, it's more about service mm-hmm And with whatever I create content wise, whether it's the podcast or my book or future endeavors and and my foundation, I wanna add days to people's lives. I wanna add quality days to people's lives. So I feel like the book, if I had to sum it up in one line, I would say my intentions are to encourage people to be thoughtful and revisit the role of violence in your life look at the impact and seek out the appropriate help, whatever that may look like for you as a group or as an individual. Um, And and that also folds into my my new foundation. I, I, I wanna put in everyone's hands who wants a, a free app that helps them, that helps usher them to the appropriate level of assistance, whether it's medical, whether it's you know legal, uh, some peer group, whatever. But 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 back to the book. Like I, I just want to help people, and encourage them, and model for them. Like hey, I know it's tough. It's painful. I'm I'm halfway editing the the audio book right now. It's not always easy because I've I've gone through so many drafts of the written form, and I'm hearing myself, uh, uh, you know, tell this story over and over and over again. And, but, you know, I I really want to impress upon people, there is tremendous value in revisiting this and resolving it because, and I thought about this earlier today, it's not wise to do that with any other malady. If you have a toothache or if you have a broken limb, it's not gonna correct itself. And a lot of times what we do as people is we operate on a set base of assumptions. And if you're going through life based on assumptions that you're all right and you're not, you're gonna make some skewed decisions because your reality is warped. So it, it, it helps to, and here's a, a, mar, a mixed martial art term, it helps to get in the phone booth, get in close proximity with those issues maybe slug it out, wrestle it out, work it out. So you have clarity and you're moving lighter and you're freeing bandwidth and you're living a more peaceful life. I can't tell you. And I used to tease people who would go, oh, I feel so great. But I would say that I'm I'm about 85% better. Like I have a peaceful life. The work leading up to it was tough. And I've been to therapy. I've journaled a ton. I've talked to people with similar backgrounds. It's not easy all the time, but it is definitely worth it. Wow. You know, in the book, you also talk about being a descendant of slaves. Do you believe that the violence exhibited by your mother, you know, we talked about um, um, the violence that you, you, you know, received from your mother, mostly in, in punishment um, form, corporal punishment. Do you believe that the violence exhibited by your mother was a product of transgenerational or intergenerational trauma? Of course. <laughs> I don't have to think much about that. It, it was modeled to her. Mm-hmm. It was modeled to her by her parents who in all likelihood, because she was raised in the rural South, it was, it was imposed upon them through racist slave owners, white people. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know a ton about my father's past, except, except in a, a, you know, they, have, they had a very large family and, and they lived in the South also. But it's like, okay, well, where was this behavior learned? My mother told me and my aunts and some of my uncles told me straight up, this is how our father was. Well, who did he learn it from? His parents and in an environment where it was okay to terrorize black people. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You described your childhood home as a minefield. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can yeah. you tell me about that? Be, I, I characterize our home as a minefield and our neighborhood as a minefield because you never knew when you were going to step onto peril. Mm. No, no day was the same. No day inside the home was the same. No day in the neighborhood was the same. And, 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 and when I was writing the book, I thought, okay, what, what does this circumstance remind me of? And then I thought it reminds me of soldiers walking on patrol and then you step on a landmine. Mm-hmm. And you don't know that you stepped on a landmine until you step on a landmine. If you're lucky, you know that you're on a landmine and you keep your foot there and, and somebody can put counterweight there and you can get off. And otherwise, you, you, you're going to catch the, uh, you're going to catch the unexpected wrath of whatever that situation is. And there's, there's no real way of preparing for that other than being on high on on threat assessment mode or or on high what i describe as high alert Mm -hmm. and i heard someone say that animals can do that like a a gazelle can be grazing out in the jungle or in a safari and then get chased by a a predatory cat and then run off and then they're safe and then go back to eating grass Mm mm-hmm Well, humans don't function like that. Right. That stays with us. And it can stay with you for hours or weeks or months or in some of our cases, years. So that the minefield analogy was the best characterization for me. Yeah. You know, I interviewed um, a somatic experience practitioner. He was actually my um, somatic experience practitioner. And he used the the analogy of... um, the gazelle, or I think, yeah, I think he just, he, or a zebra out in the wild and how, what happens is when the zebra is being chased by a wildcat or a lion or tiger, um, it goes into flight mode. Right. But then once the, the, um, predator, the cat catches it, it immediately goes into freeze its nervous system shuts down because so it doesn't feel anything. But then what happens naturally in a gazelle or a zebra's brain functioning, if the lion happens to get distracted and that gazelle is able to escape, what happens is it runs to its herd, you know, safety in numbers, the whole idea of being with your group. What What they're able to do is shake that fear out they, they're able to feel their feelings, right? It's like, so, you know, that feeling when we, we experience trauma, we try to brush it off. So what happens? It's trapped. Instead of us being able to shake and let it out of our body and let it out of our system, um, that's why gazelles or zebras are able to adapt better and go, go back to grazing because their their brain actually says like, okay, the, the fear is gone, but you know, let's, let's just get it out of our system. Whereas we are, we are more likely to say, I don't want to feel this anymore. So we work really hard in being able to, to t- make that pain go away or make those thoughts go away. But the truth is it never goes away. Right. Um, it really stays with you. And going back to your, your home, your neighborhood being, a minefield. You also described that peace in your home really depended on your mother's mood. Can you explain how that was as a child to hope your mother's in a good mood? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll try to be concise about it. My mother, my mother died in 2000, almost right towards 2012 at the age of 76 and she had colon cancer and toward her toward her terminal stages she and this this is a story as told by my sister who relieved me from doing like 48 hours in the hospital of being with my mother Mm 
They wanted to medicate my mother and she was very resistant. And they asked my sister to leave the room. So four grown men went into the room of my mother, closed the door. And my sister described, you hearing a ruckus and the, you know the sounds of fists hitting flesh. And she said, Walk, out walked like three or four grown men exhausted and saying, whew, that woman's tough. How old is she? That was my mother at 76. Tough presence, the voice to go with it. Um, she's the toughest person I've ever met. So, and I'm saying this as a, I'm a 6'4", 220 pound man. I still stand by that. So as a child to see the power she wielded, even though my, my father was a bigger man, I saw the authority she wielded. And, you know, when you're a small child and you see someone who's loving, but also inflicts pain on people bigger than you are, then that carries a lot of weight. So you know, it's, it's, it's my whole thing was let me stay out of her way. Let me try to not be seen sometimes. Let me try to not make her angry. And, and it's a lot of guesswork of not necessarily living on cruise control, but living in a manner where I don't upset her. Because I watch what happens when other people upset her. Like I'm, I'm that vulture on the rock watching the activity down, mm -hmm. you know, in the canyon and, 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 you know, seeing her fist fight, fist fight with my father and seeing her discipline my siblings with belts and other forms of discipline. It's, it's, it's a weird, it was just a weird dynamic where, she, you know, I would, you know, we would get this merciful, loving side of her, but then you also are storing in your memory bank that this is this is a ferocious woman at times. And, you know, when you don't have the tools as a kid to contextualize things and you don't have the tools to keep yourself safe, whether it's physically or emotionally, it's, it's exhausting. It, it was just exhausting sometimes, like not knowing what would upset her and not knowing like, hey, she's really scared or she's just really traumatized. Mm -hmm. I didn't really look at it in those terms until later as an adult. Like I didn't know why she was on Xanax. I just got her the pills and it made her happy. So, um, you know, it's, 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 just, it's, just, it's just hard, man, to, to, to try to figure out how to navigate that temperament mm -hmm. and develop as a kid into an adult or a young man is exhausting. Yeah. You were, your, your nervous system was just operating at a higher stress. Just, Oh yeah, yeah. I can. Yeah. I, I was, I was actually sexually abused by my father. So, I mean, I know that oh. it, it can be as a child, you're, you're just confused. Like this is the person who's supposed to show me love, but then there's this, um, there's this disconnect like this isn't this isn't supposed this isn't right right like this is um and then you start to feel unsafe but then they're the they're the only person who is supposed to be making you feel safe um but you do say that you realize you didn't obviously you didn't realize she was traumatized you didn't realize she was dealing with her own stuff were you angry with her as a child <laughs> <laughs> Almost every day. And I'm laughing because it's not a silly question. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> I was angry with her a lot. I mean, and uh, leading up until, leading up until maybe the final hospitalization, she was still a fiery woman. Um, yeah, there was a lot of anger. There was a, there was anger towards her. Like I would give her a lion's share of the anger. And there was some directed at my father because I felt sometimes, why aren't you protecting us from this? Mm -hmm. You're the man of the house. 
and I, 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 that's why I made the statement in the book is that he had the authority, he had the mm. responsibility of being the provider and protector, but very, but relative to her, less authority. Mm-hmm. And, but, but yeah, man, it's, it, it, I had a lot of anger towards her. I, I have less anger, a lot less anger for her now. I don't know about some of my other siblings. Um, and, and actually there's only, you know, there's my, my brother passed in 2000, I want to say 2015, no, yeah, 2015, but, but if he were alive, I think he would still, two of us still have, or like, a, you know, he, he would still have anger towards her. When was it that you realized that this, this wasn't, this was just trauma for her? For her? Yeah. When did you, when, when did you realize, cause I know in the book, you also, you also describe a lot of love for her. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when did the anger, I guess you still say you have a little anger, right? But you were saying, but when did it dissipate? When were you able to say, I understand? Right. Good question. So my understanding of her matured over the years. And I would say when she would share stories with me and when my aunt would share stories with me, it, it was clear as a teenager, hey, a lot of things that happened to her were not right. They were bad. In my 20s, I would say in my, my mid-20s, I, I started mid twenties to late thirties, I started actively using the word trauma. Mm. And late thirties and beyond, I looked at her more of, this is a wounded woman, you know? So I I would say at that stage in my, my, my late thirties, empathy really started to set in and it's easier to know where someone is coming from and to, for me to, uh, if, if, I, if I can apply some empathy towards you, I'm gonna release a lot of resent, resentment, anger, frustration, because I, 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 I understand your story. I see you, mm-hmm. you know, holistically. Um, just like, you know, as a side note, like uh, I had a lot of resentment towards people in my neighborhood. Like I couldn't stand, I couldn't stand. Like I, at some points hated certain people in my neighborhood because they were posing threats or disrupting the peace, the level of peace that I wanted. But with age and experience and exploring my past, it's like, okay, that guy that wanted to shoot me, I used to, fantasize about street justice taking care of him. Yeah. Now I look at him and say, he couldn't, he couldn't have come from a home of love. Right. He couldn't have been uh, a happy young man with, with a decent set of emotional tools to want to shoot me because I bump into him on a bus. Right. And, and, and I apply a lot of that with my mother. It's like, she, I, I feel in my heart of hearts, she, she didn't want to hurt us. She wanted us to be tough, resilient, functioning people, which we are. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're all, my siblings and I, or, you know, are professional people, well-traveled, um, high-functioning, cultured, and all that. You know, it's, it, just, it just so happens that the violence was the cost of admission to get all of these attributes. Well, I'm also assuming that, you know, when she wasn't angry, when, you know, when she was happy, that she was loving, you know, and I think that that kind of and and understanding her past obviously, obviously really does help. Um, and you also describe that, you know, your mother expected nothing less than perfect. <laughs> You know, I know that for many people, including myself, who struggled with abuse can have can have trouble believing that they're enough or they keep striving for that type of perfect that doesn't exist. Um, 
so has that affected you her need for perfection in you <laughs> Am I I'm probably gonna laugh at every question you ask. <laughs> it, it's just it's just when 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 people when when phrases hit home I kind of I, I laugh sometimes yeah. so yeah it, it did affect me in a, a, a big way and I I know that about myself I continue to work at it um but but that too had a cost um you know like her whole thing of the way we did our chores like it has to be spotless, like military grade spotless. Mm -hmm. I know? read that. I was like, Shh. <laughs> I was like, oh God. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so, but, but it spills over into other parts of your life, whether you know it or not. And it spilled into relationships. It spilled over into friendships where, you know, like I've been told like, man, you, you're hard on people. So, okay. Yeah. I said, you know, Fair. That's fair. Like I'll cop to it. I'll, I'll tell you mm -hmm. what I'm great at, but I'll also tell you what I suck at sometimes. And that was something I sucked at. And I, I hope, you know, you, you, I, I hope people forgive me for that. Um, but, but, but it also meant I've been hard on myself also, you know, having mm -hmm. high expectations. And, you know, not necessarily, not consciously knowing like, hey, you know, I want this, I want things in my life meeting a certain standard. And, uh, but so, so yeah, man, this, this expectation uh, of when stuff happens, how fast it happens, how it happens, it, it definitely, it, 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 it's, it's been disruptive in, yeah. in different, in different sectors, or I guess I want to say different areas of my life. So yeah, she's she's a product of that. But but I also want to say, you know, I, I'm on the hook to to correct that yeah. and make that right and make that right with people where it's appropriate. So I just don't want to say, okay, well, I was abused and traumatized. It's like, well, it is you and it is your life. So you have to figure out how how to maybe adjudicate some of that stuff and you gotta figure out how to make it right and you gotta figure out how to make adjustments as you go forward yeah well you know for me it was always I was always there ha always had to be like I had to present myself a certain way right like my parents they weren't those parents that were like learn from your mistakes they were the parents that were like don't make mistakes mm -hmm. right so that would that made everything really hard for me you know and even now like i feel I have this feeling like I'm not enough. I'm not, even though I have these goals, I'm not doing, I'm not reaching these goals because they're not, you know? And then the thing is when I reach those goals, I move, I move the, I move, I keep oh. moving the line. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when I, when I keep pushing the line, I, I, all of a sudden, like, you know, I get burnt out and I'm like, I'm a failure. And then that's kind of how, um, my life play, played out for a really long time. So that's that's mm -hmm. kind of how it really affected me. Um, so, yeah. And, and, you know, you did talk about it spilling over into relationships, right? Like, how can you describe how, how, you know, those traumatic events that you dealt with, with your family, with your, the you know, your neighborhood, like, how did those shape some of your behaviors? Hmm. One thing that stands out is living in threat assessment mode. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is when there's a crisis, I'm, 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 I'm playing it out or I'm digesting it like it's a word problem, like this math problem, where it might not be in the same terms as the other person. Right. So if we're have if I'm having a dispute with a romantic interest, she may just be thinking we're having a dispute, an innocent dispute, whereas I've been accustomed to or socialized to think okay, is this a breakup? 
Or do I need to start maneuvering in a way where she's not going to call the police on me for, for some innocuous gesture or me standing up? And that's that's been the situation in work environments too. You know, just, you know, some conflict, I mean, not a fist fight, but some conflict with a colleague. It's like, okay, is this person going to go to HR on me? Like as a black person, do I have to deal with this again? Um, or, you know, the, the anecdote I shared in the opening, you know, like I, I notice, like there's a lot of good that come out of living from the inner, in the inner, in the inner city, but the, the anecdote I shared in the beginning of the book, um, like this guy was just looking wired and looking goofy. So I'm, I'm saying it all to say that sometimes guys who've never had a fight a day in their life will posture as if they're tough or as if they're ready to defend the world. I know a different reality behind that. And that reality is you never know when somebody is going to kill you or try to kill you or beat you to a bloody pulp and leave you impaired for life. So I'm looking at conflict with a higher level, with, with a different frame of reference of, of possibilities because I've seen those poss possibilities play out. You know, I've seen people cracked in the head with a bottle or a bat. So my frame of reference is a lot wider, but the downs, what, what can be the downside of that is I'm now carrying the stress of that possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just like the guy in the parking lot is like, okay, what am I prepared to do to defend myself? A lot, maybe more than this guy can imagine. Wow. My world, like you, you'll use the environment, you'll use a car, you'll use your keys, the heel of your, your hand, but man, it's, it's you know, I, I like, and I borrow the phrase from Dr. Drew Pinsky is he said, everything costs, everything costs, it's going to cost something. And, and, and the stress of those experiences when, you know, when you start ex experiencing that in your own mind and your body, it could be very, very high. So, so yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Am I exhausting you? <laughs> no, I, I, I'm just imagining living in that high stress. I mean, I, I feel like I, I do live in maybe not as high of a stress level as you do, like with, with, in, with people around you. Um, but yes, I do. I, I, I know that that can be exhausting. When did you realize that you were struggling with PT, PTSD? When did you realize that that was not normal and that you needed to get help? I want to say, well, I'm 51 now. So I want to say I want to say my late 20s. I I got I was aggressively seeking answers. And especially my early 30s, I, I was aggressively seeking answers through therapy and self-reflection and reading and I, I was only comfortable sharing it with a small circle of people, people who I felt would be caring and kind and understanding towards me and not people who would say stuff like, oh, we'll get over it. Mm, yeah. Or say stuff like, like, like I, have a, I have a dear friend, a dear friend, and he says, well, why are you thinking like that? You're not there anymore. Wow. Well, yep. But dude, you didn't live that life. Like your, your parents, your parents rubbed elbows with, with broadcast executives. I had a different reality. So memories and responses to those memories are just responses like an or biological response to similar situations yeah. stay with you unless you start actively doing something to address that. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know if you've read the book, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. It's a fantastic book. It basically says it. your 
your your reaction to things is your nervous system reacting. Every all of that trauma is stored in your body. You know, he may say that you're not living, you're not living in that reality anymore, but you really are until you are able to work on it. Like that's a lot of work too. So um, that is something that a lot of people who have not been, who have not been through trauma, they just don't understand. And, it, and, and that's, it's really hard. So, you know, what type of therapy did you seek? Did you seek any specific modalities or was, were you just focused on like talk therapy? You know, it was really, as you say, talk therapy for the most part. I mean, I was married once and, and we touched on that in couples counseling. And then I've done several rounds of, of um, individual counseling when I, when I felt like it was appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so mostly that meditation played a huge role of being able to quiet my mind and, and be more disciplined in managing my emotions Fitness really helped, like, you know, working out several times a week. I believe also diet <laughs> plays mm -hmm. a huge part in it. Like, I, I can't speak to the science of it, but I would say, like, having a healthy diet helps to have, a, a, helps me to have a balance and a very much centered uh, constitution. But, but back to the counseling, yeah, it's just, it, it was just been mostly through through one-on-one -on -one sessions with a counselor, just really hashing things out. And then at some point, you know, like I may, you know, I may, uh, I'll listen to people like Joe Dispenza um, or, or some other people who are, who are experts on this, or I'll, I'll journal about it or, or you know, I, I haven't honestly read a lot of books on it. And it's probably something I'm going to do more of as, as I get as I devote more time into my foundation and, and I actively seek people who are, who are experts and authorities on the various colors in that spectrum. Yeah. I, I, for me, I, I mean, I did talk therapy for years, right? Um, I didn't talk about my own abuse for a long time. Um, but, you know, I hit a wall and, and I had to seek residential treatment and I just, I was lucky someone, sent me to Tucson, Arizona um, at Sierra Tucson. It was, it's a residential treatment center and everything they did was holistic. It was, I don't know if you've heard of like eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is EMDR. Um, that, that, that really changed so much. It was basically moving the, you know, the event, like the, the abuse that happened to me, it was moving it. It was basically transferring that memory from my emotional side of my brain to my rational side of my brain. So I, whenever I thought about it, my, my nervous system didn't kick up into like feeling like those heart palpitations, the stress level. It was, it was like, I, after that, I was able to talk about it. Like it was just some event that just happened. Um, and then, you know, I did all types of modalities and I, and I just talked about this recently, just in January, I, I tried, um, MDMA, um, assisted therapy, which is like, it's psychedelic therapy, hmm. um, which was really, um, it was a, it was a really incredible experience. And I think from there, I was able to even find some compassion for my dad being that he was in, he was also in an environment that normalized, even though I don't know if I want to say I forgive him, but I, it, it was like when I, when I did the um, drug assisted therapy, I, it was like he, I was playing a movie in my head of his childhood kind of strung together from like different conversations people had. And it felt like I was there watching this movie of his childhood. And from there I was like, Oh my gosh, this wasn't really, he didn't do this to hurt me. He did this because he just didn't know any better. And I, you know, I hate saying that it kind of makes me cringe a little bit, but it made me, it created a lot of empathy for me. Um, and I think I'm, I'm very much of, I'm very much an empath. I feel like I, 
I, you know, I have a lot of empathy kind of to a fault sometimes um, for what a lot of people go through. So, yeah, I, I think I think, it, you know, I think trying out all different modalities of, of healing, um, especially holistic ones, you know, um, obviously the MDMA was drug assisted, but I that was also for me to get off of um, like antidepressants because um, uh -huh. I, d I definitely wanted to not have to be on antidepressants because they made me feel kind of bad, um, but in a mentally well, but physically not so great. Um, but, you know, knowing what you know now, what are your feelings about corporal, corporal punishment or physical punishment and rearing children? Hmm. That might be a little surprising. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I definitely think, like, I have a hard line that shouldn't be crossed. Like, like I, I don't know if I want to say I'm anti-spanking. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would want to, I, I, I would say definitely I'm against, you know, using a belt, punching, slapping a kid. Um, sp spanking with your hand, I, I, I would probably put that more in an acceptable range. Um, but but just beating your kid, man, I I don't see a lot of good coming out of that. Like it's going to be, there's going to be some negative impact either, you know, you, you, I, I fear that people would risk raising a future abuser, mm -hmm. a coward, uh, 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 what's the phrase, um, you know, just somebody that's going to wilt under pressure. So I, I think my long winded or my shorter response for that is anything beyond spanking with your hand for a small child to get their attention, I would probably discourage that. Mm -hmm. And 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 if you if you if you if you as a parent do not have the tool set to speak to your kid and use other tools to rear them and and discipline them then you probably shouldn't be having kids. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I feel like, especially in the US now, and maybe some other countries that a lot of people would, you know, they'd be a gas and, and have a strong reaction to that. So, you know, my, my argument is, you know, okay, what, what's your best argument for doing that? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I know that there's, you know, now there's so much research about how to rear children without spanking you know i i'm and i and i think that for some parents especially parents who have come from homes where it's been abusive or it's you know physical punishment you know i that's what they know right so yeah i think that it, they just need there's there's resources out there especially with the national children trauma National Child Trauma Stress Network. I mean, they have great alternatives to spanking. Um, so that's that's definitely a resource people can go to. Um, you know, you talk about the READ method, R-E-A-D method. Can you tell me about that? Sure. There's an interesting backstory on that. Um, one of the people I shared when I was still in the process of writing the book is a woman named Kathy Eldon. Kathy heads up a nonprofit here in Malibu, California called Creative Vision. So it's basically a nonprofit that supports art. And I was sharing the idea of the book with her and where I was with it. And she says, you know, this, you, she said, like, I feel like you should leave people with something more than, than just a book. And uh, she's like, I don't know if it's a pamphlet or a how-to or whatever. And then I, I gave her some thoughts. I said, you know, I'm gonna think about that. And then, so the basic question for myself was, well, if you had to paraphrase your methodology for how you came to terms with all the transforma transformational moments in your life, what would you say? 
And that's when I came up with the read method. So the, the read method is acronym for reflect, engage, analyze, and disrupt. Um, and just as a side note, I'm going to, uh, when I finish the website that I'm making as, as a companion to the book, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to upload or make available a PDF where people can access that. So basically, you know, using, you know, as an example, the guy that wanted to shoot me on the bus that I bumped into an accident, it's like, okay, well, you have this, you have ill feelings toward this, that for, towards this guy. So let's reflect on it. It's like, okay, you bumped, you bumped hands with him on a bus. He wanted to fight you. He wanted to shoot you. What kind of home do you think he came from? You know, let's engage with that. You know, what, what kind of tools that you had, did you have? What kind of tools did he have? What, what stage of life are you in? So let's start analyzing that. And it's like, okay, well, he couldn't have come from a place of love. And he, he learned to engage with other people or, or to resolve conflict in that manner. He didn't just, I highly doubt that he just, you know, just woke up and said, you know, when somebody makes me mad, I'm going to shoot them. You probably saw that somewhere. So once I process all of that, then, you know, just continue to adjudicate it. Then I'm at a level where I can disrupt that because now I'm moving from a place from anger to a place of empathy, mm -hmm. empathy for him, empathy for myself. And, and, you know, I, I just applied that unknowingly towards all of these moments and all of these characters in my life. And even, you know, I didn't even really touch on the weird sexual inappropriateness from, el from, from elders. You know, I was never abused, but there were some close calls. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, that's like, that, that's something I'm gonna offer to people um, just as a resource. I'm not a licensed therapist. I'm, I'm not a clinician or anything. That's just my layman's terms of saying, hey, maybe this is something you can apply in your, old, your, in your own life, whether it's a single moment or if you wanna pace yourself and look at the body of your life. Amazing, I think that's a really great method. I think a lot of people would benefit from it. Definitely the, the epitome of a trauma survivor thriver, I would say. Oh, thank you, I appreciate that. I well, appreciate that very much. And thank you for coming on, I do appreciate it. Thank you, Lori Lee, it's been a pleasure. That was Imani Khalid, trauma survivor thriver, founder of Invia Foundation, host of the Misconnected podcast, and author of There Was Violence. For more information on Imani, including where to purchase his forthcoming book, please visit atstpodcast.com. That's the letter A, tstpodcast.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my monthly magazine, Authentic Insider, for more in-depth, inspirational stories and everything mental health. Thank you so much for being a part of the conversation. I'm Lori Lee Binstock, and you've been listening to a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. Take care.